Hi, Evan, and welcome back to Romania. Good morning. It's really good to see you. Really happy to talk to you, uh, and I'm really happy that your, your book, the, the Mastermind, has been translated into Romanian. So can you tell us what the Mastermind is, is about? What's the, the idea behind the book? So the book is about, uh, it's predominantly about a guy named Paul LaRue, Paul Calder LaRue. He's a South African computer programmer who started out in programming, wrote some computer software that's actually pretty well known, encryption software. And then so at some, a certain point in his life, he decided that uh, he wanted to make a lot of money. So he started selling prescription drugs, painkillers over the internet to American customers. And he made hundreds of millions of dollars doing this in the mid 2000s from about 2006 to 2012. And that was sort of his main venture. And then he took the money that he made doing that and kind of converted it into a vast criminal empire that was based in the Philippines, but stretched all around the world, including here in Romania, where he had an office and a company and a lot of programmers working for him. Wow. Uh, but he got involved in major drug dealing, selling arms to Iran, having a militia in Somalia, violence, murder, uh, enforcement of his uh, business. So the, the story is how he created that empire. And then on the other end, how law enforcement tried to, to track him down over the years. It took them a long time, the US Drug Enforcement Administration, and then other authorities all around the world, and how they caught him. So it's sort of both stories of him and the people that are involved in his business and the people who tried to stop him. So how did you come across this, this story and what was it about LaRue and his dealings that made you give it, what, five years of your life? Five or years, if not yeah. more? Um, the first time I came across something connected to Paul LaRue was the arrest of a guy named Joseph Hunter. So Joseph Hunter was a U.S. military, former U.S. military, U.S. Army sniper instructor who was arrested in 2013 as part of a plot to murder a DEA agent. So he was basically a mercenary. And he was operating on the other side of the world, willing to kill people for money. And I saw a story about this and I thought, well, that's an interesting story, a kind of like US soldier gone bad. And I pursued it very lightly for a little while, but then eventually it came to light that his boss was this man, Paul LaRue, and that Paul LaRue was this computer programmer that he had had this whole other life. He had invented this encryption software and he had all these facets to him. And I think what really hooked me was the idea that Paul LaRue was a kind of tech mogul. He was a kind of uh, mirror image of a tech CEO. Right. Except the unicorn bad. of crime. <laughs> exactly. He was the person who created the $100 million disruptive startup business, except on the other side of the law. And you had no idea when you were following Hunter that there was this shadow figure behind him and then this whole, the whole big thing. No, I knew that there was someone behind him. Okay. That's part of what hooked me in is I knew he was not just operating on his own. He was working for someone, but it was very unclear who it was. And when it became clear that that person was Paul LaRue, and Paul LaRue was a, was a, was a mystery. He was a ghost. He, he didn't allow his photo to be online. So he was very, very difficult to sort of sort out who he was and where he came from. And that's part of why it took five years of my life to, to, to do it. All right. So uh, in this book, it, this is filled with drug dealers and mercenaries and, and, and contractors. So how were you able to track down these, these folks and get them to talk to you? It's not like what they do, what they do is above the law. <laughs> some of them, some of them, I will say, took kind of, you know, old fashioned reporting, calling one person, calling another person, sort of putting it out there that I was looking for them, letting them find me. Um, all the techniques you would do, showing up at someone's house and knocking on the door. Um, other of, of them were surprisingly easy to find. I mean, there was a guy who was a hitman who worked for Paul LaRue, who I found on LinkedIn, the social network LinkedIn, because he had put one of Paul LaRue's companies that he worked for in his resume. Uh, he claimed to be doing something else for them, not actually murdering people, but I just found him online and I sent him a note and he said, I should really take that off of my resume, I guess. But there were people who did not even recognize that they were findable. And there were people who didn't even recognize that what they were doing was illegal because there were so many people involved at so many different levels. A lot of them didn't even know they were working for Paul LaRue. They just knew they were working for a pharmaceutical company or a 
gold mining company or a you know money transfer company they didn't know that they were part of this criminal empire all right has this story at any point felt dangerous like physically dangerous to you i think there were one or two points in reporting in the philippines where i felt a little bit nervous about our situation just because we often i was working with a local reporter on finding people and we often we just didn't know what we would encounter when we went out to knock on someone's door we didn't know if they knew we were coming sometimes we didn't know if how they would react i would say in most cases we were pretty cautious and we we had a good sense of what was safe and what was not the times that were scary to be honest were around the police because there were a lot of corrupt police that Polaru used in the Philippines to maintain his base there he basically paid off police all over the country and so not knowing which of the authorities you can trust is also a very uh, it, it it creates a, a special kind of uncertainty i think okay so you uh you paint Paul Leroux as this, the, the CEO of this big illegal company. So I'm wondering in terms of looking at, at him as a CEO or as a, someone who leads an, an, an operation, what were your insights into how he, what kind of a, I don't know, manager he was? Well, that's interesting. I spent a lot of time thinking about him as a manager and talking to people who really wanted to talk about how he was as a manager. And he, in one way, he was a great manager and people loved him. People were very loyal to him for a long time because if, if someone had an idea, he would, he would give them free reign to go try and figure out if it would work. So he liked people who were in some sense creative and they would say, I've got a contact in Colombia and I can get a big shipment of cocaine. And he would say, okay, go, go figure it out. And if, if it worked, he would wire them $10 million to make the deal. And so... Or establish fisheries in Kenya. So, yeah, fisheries uh, in Somalia. <laughs> in Somalia, yeah, sorry. There was, you know... So he, if people had ideas, they could follow through them. On the other hand, everything really flowed through him. Like the main business, he was a micromanager and every part of it had to go through him. And so when he had thousands of people and dozens of projects all over the world, it actually, it became a kind of bottleneck that everyone had to get answers from LaRue in order for things to proceed. And so a lot of things fell apart because there was just wasn't humanly possible for one person. I mean, he's, he's kind of a brilliant thinker in his own way, but it wasn't humanly possible for him to keep up with everything that was going on. What have you learned new about writing maybe from, from doing this, this book? Well, I think I've learned that a lot of writing at, at this length is kind of organizational. Um, I mean, there's of course the times when you want to sit down and really write the best description or really try and capture uh, what happened in a particular scene. But the bigger challenge of a book like this is just organizing the vast amount of information. and. I had so much information I was just drowning in literally hundreds of thousands of pages of documents and interviews and I went all over the world and photos and so being able to kind of structure that was really the bulk of the writing process and the actual writing of the words was sort of, not that it was secondary, I mean ultimately that's what a book is, but that part kind of flowed from the first part in a way that I didn't quite expect because I think I would have thought well, you just sit down and you start on page one and, and you tell the story. Okay. But in fact, all of the blocking out of what happened, that kind of set up the story and then I just sort of wrote through that. Can you say a little bit more about what the connection to Romania is for this book from what you've gathered in your reporting? Yeah, there's, um, there's a couple connections to Romania. One is that um, Paul LaRue used a number of uh, programmers who were trained here, Romanian, um, they were actually his kind of technical back office a lot of times where um, if people in other parts of the world, so he had a huge office in Israel, he had a huge office in the Philippines, he was running these big call centers where if people bought drugs online and they had a problem with their shipment, they would contact these call centers. And so that software powering those call centers was serviced by office, an office in particular in Romania and a number of programs that he used here. So that was one aspect. And then the other aspect was, well, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but when they wanted to lure uh, some of the people that worked for him into custody, so they, they had a lot of people they wanted to catch, the USDEA, 
and some of them were Israeli. They couldn't arrest them in Israel because they couldn't be extradited from Israel. So they lured them to Romania, uh, actually, on, to, to have a meeting, a supposed meeting with Paul LaRue at a hotel very close, not that far from here. Wow. And they arrested them in the lobby of the hotel when they arrived. And then those people spent, I think, the maximum time, maybe it was 60 days or something, in, in jail here in Romania before they were extradited to the to the US. My last question, and I don't think this is a spoiler, but I'll leave it to you to answer around it. Uh, but you, you talked in multiple interviews about how you believe that Paul LaRue actually enjoys the attention that a book uh, um, gets him and that this might be one of the things he uh, was lacking in his life. Can you say a bit more about how that insight came about and if you know whether he's read the book or not? <laughs> I, so I, I, I got that insight from people who worked for him, so that in, including people who were close to him, for instance, his cousin, uh, who worked for him, grew up with him. And uh, he said that to me, another high-level employee said that to me, and they basically said uh, some version of, if you write this book about him, that is what he wants. Ultimately, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be known as the biggest criminal that ever lived, the biggest global criminal there was, he said that when he was arrested, he would be on CNN, and that it was sort of ended up being true. I mean, he was in the New York Times, and I do have some sense that he was monitoring and had some some desire for publicity, and he was monitoring the publicity. I don't know specifically that he's read the book. One person who was in uh, was in jail with him told me that he had read the articles that I did that led to the book. Okay, but I trust that account for the most part. I mean. He doesn't have that much to do, so I would assume if he can get a hold of a copy of it, my guess is that he probably read it, but I'm not, I can't say for sure. Thank you very much, Evan. This, is, this has been a pleasure, and uh, yeah, you all should go and uh, buy this book and read it. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. I'm so happy to have it translated.